Welcome back everyone. The afternoon session of our webinar episode commences now. Now a quick reminder to all of our participants who may now begin to send in your questions. Again, for our Zoom participants, please send in your questions in our uh, chat box and for our FC viewers, please uh, leave your questions in our comments. Back then, he was an active student, a leader, an athlete, and an achiever. Graduated as cum laude in 1987. He pursued greater excellence and took up his MA in history in Suleiman University, after which his PhD in history at the University of Francis Thomas, where he graduated as the Makum Laude in 1999. After pursuing higher education, he went back to Suleiman University and first taught at the high school department and eventually transferred to the Department of History, where he became the chairperson for five years. In 2005, he was appointed as the Director of Instruction and later on became the Dean of the College of Education. Aside from being the Vice President for Academic Affairs of Suleiman University, he is currently one of the Commissioners of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. He was a Technical Working Group member of the Cultural Mapping Project of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. He is also a member of the Board of the Phil Philippine Studies Association Incorporated and a member of the advisory board of the Philippine National Historical Society. As a fruit of his passion for history and research, he authored the book entitled Bandit Zone, a history of the free areas of Negros Island during the Japanese occupation from 1942 to 1945. Currently, he is working on a group project about the maritime history of the Visayas and continues to study the Japanese occupation period in Negros Island. Once again, for his presentation about the Shango University from 1942 to 1945, Suleiman University during the Japanese occupation in Negros Island, here is Dr. Earl Jude Cleopas. The Jungle University, 1942 to 1945, Suleiman University during the Japanese occupation in Negros Island. A pleasant day to everyone. With the news of an impending Japanese invasion after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, preparations for wartime conditions were being planned. The Siliman Academic Community joined the nation in the mass feeling of anxiety and uncertainty. This was in the context of the fact that the newly elevated status of the university from an institute to a university in 1938 carried with it the tag as the oldest established American educational institution in the country and was still administered by American missionaries. My presentation today endeavors to examine the un unhampered operation of the university in the jungles of the mountains of Negros Oriental, despite the occupation of the whole campus by the Japanese imperial forces. It must be underscored that the university did not officially close, as the last Silliman University American president, Dr. Arthur Carson, puts it, but it just had a long layover. The written accounts of the faculty, staff, and students, as well as the Memoirs of administrator and American missionaries, including issuances of the military and guerrilla units will be used to produce a narrative of the operations of the wartime educational institution, including the reopening of the public school system that would offer a fresh perspective of the re-examination of the Japanese occupation of the Philippines during World War II. Silliman University, as an organization, existed continuously throughout the war in the Philippines from 1941 to the reopening of classes in 1945. 
It existed in the high jungle, in the upland grasslands, in the foothills, and in the towns, wherever Silliman faculty and students were found. From time to time, certain fo focus of organization and program could be located. One such center was that of the Malabu Danao Axis, another continued under the leadership of the Reverend Dr. Procolo Rodriguez in what was once to be the official evacuation center of the university in the Mayapusi area above the town of Bais. Still farther north was the Gihulngan Group, where the Lindholm and the Wynn families furnished the missionary contingent. The Bernardes and Banogon homes were in the same general area. A group of faculty members were with the forces of Colonel Gador in the Pamplona region. And then south of Malabo, the Chapman and Glans families were with the Magdamos in the vicinity of the peak of the Lasag. And Mr. Layage and was at nearby Mampas in Valencia. The Silimans and Miss Jacobs with several students were in the Shaton area. The whole province was thus dotted with university groups. On the whole, the total university picture extended far beyond such boundaries. Until May of 1942, plans had been laid in conformity with the official policy of the civil government and the military to evacuate from the coast. The objective was to establish emergency educational centers in the interior. No one had been willing under the policy of resistance to bear the onus of staying on the campus to greet the invaders. Surrender changed this picture. President Carson ordered to arrange the keys to the buildings in a box at the cooperative store, and he wrote in Chinese characters on the box, here are the keys to the campus. At that time, he was still thinking in those days of a quick repulse of the invasion, and there was no use to have doors broken down. During the Japanese occupation, there were 32 American missionaries and 126 Filipino faculty and staff members in Silliman at the outbreak of the war. As frightening accounts circulated about the treatment of civilians in enemy-held territory, Silliman families began moving to the hills. Administrative officials, however, as did a hundred or so students, remained on the campus until about May 1942. When the Japanese arrived, they immediately ordered for the registration of all property, so the administration complied, thinking that it will preserve the campus, and they registered it as a Filipino corporation in the name of the Board of Trustees. They approached Murio, a Japanese friend, but they were told that the army already knows all about the Silliman campus and it is now the property of the imperial government. This reply brought personal relief to President Carson since he was worried that the Japanese might demand to reopen the university under Japanese auspices. Eventually, the campus was occupied by the Japanese forces and the Silliman community residing in campus scampered to different evacuation places. The contacts across the line separating the occupied town and the resistance areas outside were naturally under a strain, but were never entirely interrupted. They took the form of mutual encouragement and sharing of information rather than participation in university programs. As each year during the occupation brought the date of the Silliman Founders Day on the 28th of August, President Carson in his evacuation place made it an effort to prepare the traditional message from the president, sending copies to as many points as could be reached. A very pleasant reminder of the vitality of the scattered Silliman Fellowship was the arrival of a boatload of grain from the Mindanao farm of Mr. Apolonio Molina for the Silliman faculty. Even more thrilling to the Silliman folk was to hear or to be told about the radio address of Dr. David Hibbard, the first president of the school. The message was received on the evening of May 28, 1943 from station KGEI in San Francisco. Throughout these experiences in the communities of free Negros, the university was able to function
to some small degree as a continuing educational institution. And from this experience emerge certain items of significance. At every opportunity, instruction was furnished in the same subjects as had been taught on the campus. On December 5, 1943, President Carson's journal carries the entry, School work has been renewed. So far as possible, students are encouraged to prepare the work missed since December 1941. If they take an exam or submit other evidence of finishing, credit may be given for their courses. Teachers are being requested to supply outlines for the remainder of the school year of 1941-42 and to supervise the work of student, students under them. Among the wartime students of whom a record has been preserved was Mrs. Herman Gregorio, who eventually claimed credit for completing a regular Bible course. Her husband, Dr. Gregorio, in turn, directed by correspondence, the study of Miss Estrella Echavez of Dipolo. The letters were taken back and forth by the Army Courier Service. She was finally able to complete the work of the broken semester by this correspondence course. Then we have the community school. The community school concept had long been taught in the Silliman College of Education when the school system for the guerrilla government was set up during 1942-43, the superintendent was Mr. Vinancio Aldicoa, a former Silliman student who officially sponsored the community outreach of the schools. One of the most notable missionary records of the war was that of the Reverend Paul Lindholm, who with his family had been transferred from China to the Philippines in mid-1941 and had been assigned to Silliman University, where Paul took on the post of extension worker of the rural church department. The designation was a happy one, and a good choice was also made when the Lindholm family selected an evacuation home in the hills of Kihulngan, where there was a large evangelical constituency and in an area from which the Japanese garrison was early and permanently expelled except for the threat of occasional raids by mobile units. Uh, after seeing Mrs. Lindholm and the children off to Australia in 1944, Paul returned to carry on with, with church and community activities. He was there to witness the steering days of liberation. A letter dated May 2nd from the Silliman campus told of spending two days there in emergency committee. He helped to organize the Liberation Thanksgiving Jubilee, May 26 to June 4, 1945, among the evangelical Christians and their neighbors in the Gihulngan area. President Carson called an official faculty meeting on January 30, 1944, at Barrio Candalaga near Tulong, now Bayawan. Mr. Bell, Dean Gaudel, and Sir Narciso Maharokon, Manuel Utsurom, and Vinhamin Viloria were present. Dr. Carson appointed an emergency committee to act in his absence and authorized the members to take charge of the university as soon as the Japanese relinquished control, to call back to service key faculty and staff members, and to resume classes as soon as possible. The members of this committee were Dean Gaudel, the chair, Mr. Otsurum, treasurer, and Professor Rodrigo Togade. Gerardo Imperial, and Guillermo Magdamo. The balance of university funds in the amount of 1,426 pesos was also turned over to Mr. Otsurum. In the meantime, the faculty committee organized under Dean Gaudel at Candalaga on January 30th, 1944, prepared for the same day of liberation. The record of their meetings has been made a part of the university. As liberation became a reality, they were ready to swing into action. On July 28, 1945, the chairman was able to, to propose in considerable detail a report of their success in reopening classes on July 2, 1945, and to give a picture of problems and needs. One can do little more disrespect than to render a simple word of tribute to the courage, wisdom, and devotion to duty with which Dean Gaudel 
and his committee furnished the leadership needed for this undertaking. Consequently, American forces liberated Dumaguete on April 26, 1945. A few days later, the Faculty Emergency Committee took possession of the campus and began preparing for the resumption of classes and the gigantic task of rehabilitation. All units of the university, except the College of Theology, which could not resume classes till the following summer, reopened that June. Sixteen faculty members were immediately available, with a few more arriving in time for the second semester. In the diary of Dr. Carson, he states, In the providence of God, the faculty and the basic plant of Silliman University had been preserved. From overseas resources were gathered for support. We could do no less than expected our best without delay in the service of eager students. The Jungle University had been reborn from forests and firm for a new era of service. So I will show you a few slides after this, but here's my concluding notes. Education in the Philippines had been practically suspended for a period of three and one half years. The school buildings quite generally lay in ruins. Here and there, feeble attempts had been made by the puppet government to open schools, but the dislocation of population and recurring emergencies had generally brought such efforts to naught, except possibly in a few large centers. There were the token programs by private agencies, as in Silliman's case, but in general, a huge educational deficit was facing the nation, destined to become an independent republic on July 4, 1946. The seriousness with, with which Filipino leaders viewed this crisis was evidenced by the promptness with which public schools were reopened on November 8, 1944, in a proclamation issued from Tacloban on November 4, while the Battle of Leyte was still raging. Yet, despite these challenges, the Jungle University continued to provide the educational services to the evacuation areas in Negros. To remedy school problems, private houses were rented and temporary buildings were constructed through cooperative efforts. Civilians who owned books, supplies, and equipment gave up these resources so that at least a place they can call a school could be set up. Moreover, there were no tables to write on and papers and pencils were scarce, so they had to use fresh banana leaves and bamboo sticks in their writing lessons. In essence, the Jungle University manifested the story of the teachers and students and the trials they endured is a tale of wartime courage. It is a story of teachers, students, and parents with empty stomachs and practically no clothes, whose houses were makeshift and uncertain, who suffered from malaria, dysentery, and other diseases that could not heal for lack of medicines. It is also a story of courage as they would rather succumb to diseases than surrender to the Japanese. Despite these hardships, the people cooperated with the school authorities in pu pushing through the wartime educational program, even if the teacher's compensation was only a meager allowance, they continued to teach and the people willingly shared with the teachers whatever food they had so that the schools could continue. Classes were also moved from one place to another at times when enemy patrols were expected to pass by. If the Japanese operations intensified in an area, people moved to another place and the schools disbanded. But upon the cessation of Japanese operations, classes resumed and the people were back to their work. Fundamentally, the school helped build up the morale of the people. They can be likened to the winds that fanned the fervor of the resistance. The teachers disseminated the news and the school served as a well-organized agency in circulating the good news of the war, thus helping to keep the morale of the civilian population high. Ladies and gentlemen, in the virtual world, that ends my presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Cleope. Now we are opening the floor for the questions from the audience and the public. For our FB viewers, please place your questions on the comment section. And for the Zoom participants, please place your questions on our chat box. Please indicate as well as to whom you would like your questions to be addressed. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Earl Jude Cleope will not be joining us for today's open forum. Still, we are encouraging everyone to send your questions for Dr. Cleope via email. Our research team will be collating them and uh, sending them and be sending them to Dr. Cleope. We will be pinning the email address where you can uh, where you may send your questions in the Zoom chat box and FB comment section. So for our first question. We have from A200 for X008B. Did a Japanese general, Tada, was found guilty for war crimes in Visayas? There was no uh, specific uh, reason speaker mentioning here. Did a Japanese general, Tada, was found guilty for war crimes in Visayas? Anyone from our research speakers can answer this. By the way, you may open now. You may open your cameras now for all our research speakers. Dr. Ray Gonzalez and the Sister Sonoy. Hello, good yeah. afternoon, everyone. Um, not quite familiar with the name, I'm afraid. So I don't think I can answer the question. Sure. How about the Sonoy? I think it's not here yet, so we will be proceeding with the next question. This is for everyone. How important is the topography and environment in Visayas in fostering the guerrilla movement? To everyone, how important is the topography or environment in Visayas in fostering the guerrilla movement? Yeah, I think that one I, I can answer. Um... Uh, but in, in only in so far as uh, in so far as the Panagirils are concerned, um, for one thing, the the distance, you know, the, the whole idea that it was an arch that we are an archipelago, um, practically saved um, you know Panay from being attacked in the early stages of the war. I mean, the the Japanese came and bombed. Um, you know the the important the important areas you know key strategic areas in in uh, on the island uh, particularly fort san pedro where the use of a soldiers were still gathering during that time they were still being processed and um, many of them weren't were didn't didn't uh, manage to list their names down so there are a lot of people who died that could not be accounted for um, but then there was this massive gap so between December and April of the following year, it wasn't until after Bataan Falls that the, the Japanese actually land on the island. And so that time allowed us to be able to prepare. Uh, we didn't have enough um, resources in, in terms of, say, weapons, ammunition, or heavy equipment, but we did manage to do basic things like uh, store food, uh, store fuel, commandeer vehicles, establish uh, headquarters. Um, so I think the fact that, that uh, Panay is a separate island from Luzon made that possible. Um, and I think the fact that Panay is separate from Luzon makes it possible for the guerrillas to actually consolidate their efforts. Um, because every time the Japanese have to resupply them, uh, resupply the Japanese soldiers on the island, for instance, then, you know, they had to enter only at safe points. They couldn't do it for the entire island because the rest of the island was dangerous for them. And so in one way, we were buying time for ourselves. And on the other hand, we were controlling Japanese movement as well. And if this was a large open space, then we wouldn't have been able to do it. But because this was, uh, you know, this was an island, then you could you, you could buy yourselves time and control the flow of resources and enemy troops. 
Thank you very much for that. So while while we are still waiting for Mr. Saonoy to uh, uh, get connected again, uh, this another the, uh, the next question is for uh, Dr. Gonzalez again. Why do or does Peralta have conflict with other guerrilla area commanders? Um, well, this is already kind of outside the scope of the whole um, uh, disponering. Um, but it, if, if I could, if I may, um, Peralta was able to organize um, what is arguably the most effective guerrilla unit in the entire country. Um, the 6th military district was practically intact. Uh, after the Americans surrendered, they refused to surrender, so they remained intact. The, the 6th military district was also the first uh, unit that was able to reach um, the allies. I mean, these guys used alcohol, drinking wine, um, to turn it into fuel to be able to contact um, the Southwest Pacific area. And so uh, um, he, he felt like he was making strides where some other parts of the country were not. And so the, just, just that sheer idea that the Panay guerrillas were the ones who were able to reach MacArthur, that legitimated the Panay guerrillas in a way. And I, to my mind, I think uh, Peralta not only asserted this to other guerrilla units, but as well as the civil government in, on the island, uh, that's Tomas Confessor. So he, ha he also had a clash with the civil government in hiding uh, because, well, technically he was the first to reach MacArthur. And, uh, you know, that empowered him to assert that this is what, you know, the movement wants. Um, and he even tried to organize uh, uh, the other guerrilla units into a fourth Philippine Corps. But, you know, eventually this gets blocked by MacArthur. Um, ultimately, um, his own achievements, well, the achievements of the 6th Military District, allowed them to be able to have some form of leverage um, with, the, with the rest of the guerrillas in the country. I mean, if, if, for instance, someone from, say, Luzon, like the Hunters ROTC, needed weapons, they didn't have access to the Americans, but the 6th Military District did. And so that, that simple point, for instance, um, gave the 6th Military District leverage over the Hunters ROTC guerrillas. I hope I hope I was able to make sense with that that answer. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Gonzalez. The next question: Is it true that Battle of Patag is also the last battle fought in the Philippines during the World War II? I think that's one for Mr. Saone. Uh, Mr. Saonoy. I think we should just enter the room. Okay, I think we lost Mr. Saone once again. So while we are waiting for Mr. Saone, maybe. Yes, uh, are, you got, are you getting uh, me now? Okay. Yes, we can hear you, sir, loud and clear. Can you okay. hear us? Yes, sir. Yes. Hey, that's the question. The question is, is it true that Battle of Patag is also the last battle fought in the Philippines during the World War II? Sure. Well, even while the Battle of Patag was ongoing, <clears throat> there were also mapping up operations in other places. Uh, but at the same time that we were fighting in uh, in Patag, the Battle of uh, Luzon against uh, General Masita was going on. So, uh, but by uh, but by the end of uh, July, practically the uh, the battle of Patag has been completed. Uh, the Japanese have already dispersed. They were looking for food, asking the Filipino inhabitants even for just a camote <laughs> and, uh, or salt. And General Kono has uh, retired deep into the jungle of Mount Kadladog. And there he waited until the, he's supposed to continue fighting all the way to the Gross Oriental, but he was blocked there in Murcia in Cadladog. That's a very high peak in Negros in the south of Patag. And uh, well, the war ended with the with the uh, acceptance of Japan of the non-conditional surrender from the Allied forces. 
Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for that. Now, uh, here's another question. This is from Catalino Pestaño. Uh, I think this question is for both Dr. Gonzalez, Gonzalez and Mr. Saonoy. Mm -hmm. Here it goes. What was the significance of the Visayas region <clears throat> occupying Japanese such that they had to occupy it considerably? As foreign, as foreign invaders, what gains did they expect to achieve? Maybe we can start with Sir Saonoy. Okay. Uh, the Japanese uh, war uh, plan for the defense of the Philippines uh, think or they believe that there are three possible points of attack from General MacArthur. One is in the east, which is uh, Leyte and Sabar area. One in the south, which is Mindanao. And on the west in Palawan, by the forces coming from Singapore. So while uh, Yamashita consolidated his troops for the final battle of Luzon, they, the Japanese uh, believe that uh, the initial fighting in the Philippines would be fought either in Mindanao or in Visayas. And Negros happened to be at the center of the Visayas. So the troops, over 15,000 troops were taken out of Panay. And in fact, Iloilo was uh, practically uh, uh, reduced into a defensive position with only, I think, one, one uh, regiment or something there. And the rest were brought in into uh, Negros. Uh, after Leyte, the battle was in Cebu. But the Americans uh, deflected that and attacked uh, Legayen. So some of the troops, even of Cebu, or those who escaped from Leyte, converged in Negros so that they can, because we are central, they can de be deployed in any place, whether Mindanao or uh, Western Visayas. And uh, that was the attack coming uh, directly first to Panay or to Palawan. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sa Onoy, uh, what about Dr. Gonzalez? Mm -hmm. uh, just to add to Sir Sa Onoy's uh, reply, uh, uh, Panay was, uh, well, for both uh, the Japanese at the start of the war and eventually for the Americans, Panay was um, mainly an R&R &R site. So it's where you put uh, anyone who was sick or anyone who was recuperating. But other than that, the island of Panay was uh, very convenient uh, in terms of um, if you had to invade the rest of the country, you had a road which ran around the country. Uh, you had a very strong guerrilla presence, which would uh, easily support an American advance. You had um, air uh, airstrips. You had working ports, uh, which you could use for your advantage. And ultimately, uh, to my mind, you were going to you were going to have to protect your western flank so if you were the americans you were you were going to have to break this western flank and if you were the japanese you were going to have to do everything you can to keep this western flank from uh, from falling um would i say that uh, the the Papanai island was probably one of the most important um strategically i i would say probably not not strategically, but they left a lot of wounded men there. They left a lot of um, resources, for instance, uh, things like uh, they were they had uh, they were experimenting on using cotton. Uh, they had uh, mines over in Antique, uh, so the San Remedio mines. If you lost that, that would be a loss to the Japanese war effort. So, in so far as those are concerned, they were vital. Or at least Panay Island was vital. But uh, again, I wouldn't say that Panay was probably the most important, uh, important target. Um, in fact, one of the debates was, you know, what's the value of, uh, should we actually invade Panay or do we gain more if we just bypass Panay and go straight somewhere else? And ultimately, Panay was going to be a threat to any decision you wanted to make. That's why they eventually landed in Panay. Now we have another question from George Dan P. Santos. This is for both speakers. 
Local forces had experiences in local battles remaining unknown to many people. There are countless military exploits still left undiscovered. However, in terms of politics, were politicians influential in the resistance against Japan? And were they a significant variable in the outcomes of these battles? Can we start with this, uh, Sir Saonai? Sir? Mr. Saonai? Yes? You may answer this question from George Dan Santos. Local forces had experiences in local battles remaining unknown to many people, and there are countless military exploits still left undiscovered. However, in terms of politics, were politicians influential in the resistance against Japan, and were they a significant variable in the outcome of these battles? Well, <clears throat> let me quote the General uh, Isel Berger, the commander of the 8th Army, <clears throat> that when the Americans entered Bacolod, nobody greeted them. The city was depopulated, so to say, with only a few people, to the point that uh, eventually uh, the general wrote his wife. He says, these people here in Negros are pro-Japanese because unlike the war in uh, the uh, liberation of the cities in Europe, the people were dancing, they were giving the... Uh, the uh, Americans, flowers and wine, all that, but that did not happen in the cross. So the, that was the conclusion of the, the general. <clears throat> but uh, I think the reason there is, uh, uh, Bacolod was practically depopulated at the time. Most of the people in the cross have fled into the mountains. One reason why many of the towns but deep people, not only Bacolod, but almost all the towns, only a few people were left behind. The reason because <clears throat> after the, the American uh, attack in, uh, or even before the American attack landed in Leyte, uh, Bacolod was bombed and several places Negros was bombed. And the Japanese uh, sent out information that the battle that will be fought will be in the towns. So they are telling people, get out of the towns, go to the mountains. In fact, our family left the town and went to the mountains because of that Japanese propaganda. The, uh, the fact is, the, the towns never became a battleground. It's always in the mountains. Only a few during the Japanese occupation that there will Japanese garrisons that will attack and Japanese patrols that will attack. But generally, the people of, of Negros were in the mountains because uh, even the politicians, if I call it, when they came to Bacolod to lobby for the approval of the Philippine Japanese sponsored constitution, they said, why is it that there are so many, so few people in Bacolod? Well, the reason for that is we depopulated the towns. There were very few people in the towns even then. And so when we speak of uh, the way politicians made good use of the, of the uh, Japanese occupation, uh, can be placed in the perspective that many, I said, many of our politicians collaborated with the Japanese. In fact, uh, the People's Tribunal convened after the war, listed and showed that 80% of all members of Congress, senators and congressmen were charged of collaboration. And the many of those uh, mayors and governors that left the lowlands uh, were mostly the, 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 those also in the opposition. So 
politics really played a very big role there. And even after the war, the problem is after the war, even the collaborators won the elections. Okay? That's all right? Or do you like to have a follow up or what? Whatever. That's okay, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, what about Dr. Gonzalez? Uh, I'd like to give this uh, my reply to this uh, using another angle. So I'd like to um, give the scenario by looking at three key people in um, the story of Panay. And um, those are actually um, Fermin Karam, who was the, the governor um, under the Japanese regime. And then Tomas Confessor, who kind of like left for the mountains and preserved the Philippine Commonwealth. And the third one is uh, Macario Peralta, who was accused of behaving more like a politician than a military officer, than a military commander. So these, these three people had uh, their own politics between them. In so far as you know, the detrimental effects are concerned, uh, you have things like um, Tomas Confessor had his own uh, bodyguards, his own policemen. They, he called them the emergency provincial guards. And then uh, Peralta had his guerrillas. And uh, there were many instances when they were fighting with each other. Um, abuses done by either side were not solved uh, in, a, in a more streamlined way because the, the two leaders were in conflict with each other. And both of them practically thought that Karam, or thought of Karam as, you know, sunog na tong taong to. I mean, he's, uh, he's a politician for the Japanese. So anything that comes out of his mouth, you know, na that shouldn't be believed. Um, but for, for Karam's part, you have to admire the guy because in many ways he behaved like our local version of uh, Jose Pilaurel, uh, which was he had to soften the blow. He probably had the more difficult job he was politicking between Filipinos and the Japanese. And uh, he was trying to keep Iloilo in order. Uh, he was trying to keep Iloilo from being damaged. Um, one of the reasons, for instance, why Calle Real, Royal Street in Iloilo, is still intact with buildings stretching back as far as the Spanish period um, is because the Japanese left. They didn't hole up like they did in, in Manila. Um, you know, and, and, and um, politics had to do with this, you know, pleas from the local population to not um, destroy the city. So that was one of the direct effects, you could say, of politics. Um, it was not so much as a battle, but it was more of an avoidance of battle. Uh, but that's the reason why we were able to keep a lot of our historic buildings, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that's it for me. I I, I hope there was enough to uh, answer the question. Thank you, Sir Gonzalez and Mr. Saonay. Now we have another question from Reggie Sabandal. To everyone, is the Battle of Pata currently celebrated in the area to memorialize the said historical event? For... <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think that should be me. <clears throat> Uh, in fact, after the war, nobody remembered Patag. <clears throat> it was only when I uh, bought the aside, it was only when I started uh, studying the history of the war uh, that I realized the tremendous historical value of Patag. And I worked out for so many years for the remembrance of Patag. Uh, you see, Patag is claimed by two cities, Silay and Talisay, to the point that it is considered to be a neutral place. And the Department of Environment and Natural Resources also claimed authority over there because of now it is heavily forested. It is our forest reserve the whole of Patag and Latawan. Then another factor uh, came in, the fact that a law was passed 
1995, finally, declaring that Patag is a protected area and belongs and to be under the control and development of the Department of Tourism. The problem is, until I raised that issue with PIBAO and the National Historical Commission, did the Department of Tourism found out that they are responsible for Patag. That is why Patag was never, never considered anything until those things came into being. Now, thanks to the effort of the national government, the road to Patag Anantawan is a three-lane concrete road. Very beautiful. And as you are working with Pibao, to construct there a war museum. Uh, I'm just waiting for your move because I have, I have completed mine. <laughs> so it, it would have been, but uh, we are supposed to in 19, in 2020, 20, yeah, 2020, yeah, 2020 or 2021. No, I think 2020. We are so much. We are supposed to uh, place there the historical marker, but COVID prevented us. So I have the marker, but nowhere to put. And so I, uh, we uh, proposed there to Pibao that we will consolidate this uh, together with the museum once Pibao has uh, uh, started its work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Mr. Saonoy. And we are very thankful for your efforts, sir, to uh, memorialize the Battle of Patan. So this is noted, sir. Our research team who are here with us will take note of this, and uh, uh, we will uh, have it addressed sir, right away. Thank you very much for that. Now, next next question. This is from Sherilyn Sabling. Is there any guerrilla veteran monument? I think this is somehow related to your uh, answer, sir, Saonoy. Again, is there any guerrilla or veteran monument established in the Visayan region, specifically in the island of Panay or Negros Occidental? Well, in Negros, well, in Negros we have one, a very simple one, right in front of the uh, provincial capital. It was uh, constructed by uh, the veterans. The only problem with that is that the date is wrong. And I try to correct that. Uh, because then they said that the war <clears throat> ended September 8th when the war with Condor surrendered on August 13th. Uh, that's the, the, the only error there. And I think it's because they also, uh, somebody, one veteran wrote that the war in Negros ended on September 8th. And people, even before I thought that is right until I was able to dig up in the U.S. National Archives the details of the war in Negros. And the Americans were very detailed in all that. And I was able to talk. There was a house guest of General Jones in uh, Tucson, in Arizona. And we talked about the war in Patag. Because he was the one who completed the Battle of Patag. And so the documents and the photographs that I have now, and which I included in my book, Against the Rising Sun, uh, specifically in, on, in volume two, uh, uh, is to a certain extent would immortalize already what really happened in Patag. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Saonoy. So, um, uh, I think the next question is kind of related to the uh, to the previous one, and this is for Dr. Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez, do you have any uh, particular location or site where you think a uh, landmark or a uh, monument ma uh, might be erected? Uh, was erected actually, uh, and we're very proud of it. Um, so the Balantang Memorial Shrine is the only military cemetery outside of Manila. I think I, I saw this in your your presentation earlier. And um, well, there's a very long history as to how they even managed to pull that off. I mean, 
you have a bunch of Ilongos who served in the 6th military district and they're trying to convince the national government to give them a budget to put up a shrine um, to bury their heroes, to bury their dead. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't go into the details of it, but ultimately the fact that it was granted, the fact that um, I was there this morning, you know, is a testament to how the national government actually values the significance of, um, you know, the, the, the Panay experience of the war. So um, that, that monument is only one of several in the city. There's, a, there's about four that I'm, I'm aware of. Uh, but if you go to, you know, the, the outlying towns, there would be a monument for their own veterans there. But the crowning glory would have to be the Balantang National Cemetery Memorial Shrine. Thank you very much for Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. Next question. Now we have a question from Malik Kotongan. Question for Mr. Saonay. How important do you think is the strategic position of U.S. with regards to battle of region? And did the Philippines receive reparations during this battle, sir? Ah, uh, yes. In fact, uh, many of those who fought in Patag from the military district uh, <clears throat> were inducted into the, uh, were inducted and liberated by, uh, given the back pay that they call it, by the Americans. So, but there are also many who who uh, were not recognized, even until now, they claim that they were there. Uh, you know, that's there's, there's the problem after the war because the records were mostly uh, lost. In fact, even General Ernesto Mata, who became a Secretary of National Defense and Secretary of the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, was not recognized as a, a, as a veteran. veteran. He was not recognized. In fact, he was all recognized only in 2010 when I, when I visited him and he claimed that he was not recognized. I said, why? Because he said the Americans could not find my record. And I said, but you have your record. Yeah, where? I said, in the National Archives, I have a copy of the records about you and your number and what you have <clears throat> by the U.S. intelligence. <clears throat> it's only after I gave him that copy and the copy was authenticated by the National Archives in Washington, well, actually in Maryland, that he was given his pension, he was finally recognized at the age of 93, that he was recognized as a guerrilla. And of course, I think he got also his back pay for that. There are many of those who were not recognized, but many were recognized after all. In fact, when, uh, in 2012, when I was in, the, in New Jersey, I spoke there about the war, World War II, and there were many veterans there who said, we were not recognized, but there were also many veterans there who uh, were also recognized and even, I even, well, translated into English their, their Ilongo narrative of the war and the, and the historical uh, association there in New Jersey, I think they published their uh, narratives. So the, the, uh, the Battle of Patag and the, veterans who fought there, I think up to 80% of them were really recognized. Because remember that after the war, there were many people who were included in the roster of troops, but they have never seen the war. I know a friend who got pension when he enlisted after the war at the age of 14, because he was on the only one around in the area who knew how to type, and he included his name. So they became veterans. So that's why they call better run. <laughs> Maybe people have them also. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for that, uh, Sir Paonoy. Okay, moving on to our next question. This is for Dr. Gonzalez. 
uh, Doc, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, Dr. Gonzalez, considering the Philippines was in a very bad shape after it was liberated, was it unwise for the Philippines to declare independence so quickly in the post-war period? Um, I think this is a question that is probably best analyzed from the scope of a different historical episode, the uh, in Independence Day. Um, that is to say that, you know, we have ever since um, the Philippine-American War, we have been fighting for Philippine independence. I mean, politicians ran for office between the 1900s and uh, uh, the 19, uh, sorry, 1935 and the 1920s. Um, and no one who ever said that the Philippines should not be independent since it stay under the American wing ever won. If you ran for politics ballet using that platform, you were certainly going to lose. Um, so we really wanted it and we fought for it. And, you know, one of the reasons, ballet, why, you know, when, when the veterans say that uh, um, they were, what you, this is in particular, uh, some of the people I know uh, who were Yusufi guerrillas, but stayed in the Philippines and received Philippine pensions over American ones. Um, they were saying something like, "I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a mercenary. We were not mercenaries. We fought for, uh, we fought for the Philippines. We didn't fight for America. We fought for the Philippines. And even if the Philippines was a colony of America, you know, we were the ones living, dying, breathing here. And so that's what we really fought for. Um, I think the real question shouldn't be um, whether we, it was uh, it." Uh, how do you say that? Whether we deserve independence. Uh, I think the question is whether we have actually, no, sorry, the question shouldn't be whether we have earned independence. Certainly we have earned it. We fought for it. Um, the question is whether we deserve it. And so there, there is a lot of wisdom in interrogating, um, you know, what have we really done with the independence that was won in 1946? We should have gotten it in 1945, but the war was still going on. Um, and we finally got it. We have the rest of Philippine history to use as a basis for whether we did the right things. Um, and, you know, in, in my opinion, we, we had to run a Philippines ourselves. But did we do it properly? Or what have we learned from all our mistakes in the past? That's an entirely different discussion. Um, but I do, I do appreciate the sentiments of the question. Thank you very much for that. So much for answering this that question, sir. We have another question from Shasha. What date did Japan surrender Kono? I think this one is for Perseope. What's that again, please? What? What date did Japan surrender Kono? Well, Kono surrendered on August 30 uh, because it took some time for the, uh, Colonel Lowry to contact him in the hinterlands. Uh, and then there were uh, several negotiations about where they are going to take, uh, to actually surrender. The reason for the, even, it was very, very secret because they were afraid that if the Filipinos would know where Kono would surrender. The Filipinos might attack the area. So he was surrendered in Santa Rosa, in Hacienda Santa Rosa in Murcia on uh, in the morning of August uh, 30. And in fact, only one Filipino was allowed in that surrender rights. Only one. Uh, and all the soldiers were told to be prepared to even shoot Filipinos who would dare to attack the Japanese forces there. They were afraid for that. So it was top secret uh, for that uh, surrender for General uh, Kono. And uh, when he was brought to Bacolod after he collapsed, and he was brought to Bacolod, nobody ever knew that he was already at Bacolod. Only when he, he picked out, when he looked out of the window, 
Did somebody shout? That is Kuno. But by the time the Americans already barricaded the Sea uh, Breeze Hotel, and then in the middle of the night, they ferried him out by plane to Manila. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, Kabat. Next question, po. Uh, this is for Mr. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez once again. This is actually the first time I have learned about Ilongo's ingenuity during World War II. My question is, if the locals of Panay are uh, were aware of these events or have these events been obscured by the mainstream historical knowledge about World War II? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, off the top of my head, I'd say if I was uh, if I was talking to the parents of my friends uh, or people who were older, um, they knew exactly what I was talking about. But for I'd say people who were my age and younger, they they couldn't get the reference. So it makes for a lot of really bad dad jokes, actually. Um, when you try to crack a joke or make a reference about the war and your friends or people, your students, my students, certainly younger than me, they, they can't really relate to it anymore. So it's something that we're gradually losing. Uh, but it's, it's with these little, you know, things like this, what we're, we're doing, uh, where we are able to retain that. Um, and I think at, at some point when we are going through the stresses of uh, life as <laughs> as a people, we are going to rediscover that same ingenuity again. That's not to say, of course, that the, the only the Ilongos were, were ingenious. I think, um, um, I, think I probably needed to, um, uh, I, I needed to assert that more in my presentation. Thank you, sir. Now, this is for both of you. Paul, um, what is the importance of shrines and museums? Well, uh, right. shrines are built in order to, as you put in one of those things, uh, lest we forget. That's the same uh, slogan in Israel. People do forget. And after three generations, unless history is written and retold, verbally told, uh, people tend to forget. And as he said, those who forget the lessons of history are bound to repeat them. So the same thing with the war. Uh, people have forgotten the uh, what happened during the war, the treachery of their own leaders, the uh, loyalty of the ordinary Filipinos, the collaboration of their friends and the suffering and sacrifice of their neighbors. Uh, it is always a repetition of what every society undergoes. That is why uh, I took the difficult task of collecting as much information I could get about the war and uh, thank God I was able to write uh, two volumes of it from the beginning of the war until its end. But even then, even then that more than 1,000 plus pages of, uh, of narrative, there are still many things there about the war that have not been included. Uh, for example, uh, people forget that uh, I think you heard of the Sondala Widow. People thought that's a love story, love song. It's not. It's only a war song. It's a war song. Uh, but it is quoted in such a way that it appears like a love song. But it is actually a love of a citizen to his country and to his people that you are like my Dela Widow, that you are like the bird in my life, that you are my love. So anyway, there are many other things that, uh, like, for example, the, 
So this ponering, which, 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 the word which you still use, to be the one, <laughs> Dr. Gisali said, still the same. And so many other things that we uh, need. And it's, it's very, very uh, sad that even our Department of Education does not include World War II. It's not there. Like, for example, you showed here the different shrines, how beautiful they are. How many people have seen it? How many people realize the value of those shrines? I know what they tell the story that they tell. Those shrines tell millions of words, you might even say, what we see there. That's why even if uh, I'm pretty old, you know, I, I went through the war. I was four years old when the war, oh, three and a half years old when the war broke out. <clears throat> I really do not like it, my memories to be lost. That's why I'm working for this museum. Because I have many collections here to put in that museum. Otherwise, my house is, has become already a museum. The collection of papers, documents of the war, and artifacts are here with me. So where will I bring them? Will my great-grandchild bring that in her house? I don't think so. But we need to share that with everybody. And I think this is how people would, must play a greater role. Of course, this is a National Historical Commission. But you notice the word is historical commission. But yours is memorials, shrines about the war. Our war museum here is not just about World War II. I'm going to backtrack into the time of the Filipino revolt against Spain, the war against Spain, the war against the Americans, which I did. I don't know if so many people know about the Philippine-American War. When I went to West Point, and also like uh, two years ago in the Pentagon, when I asked them about the Philippine-American War, can you believe that colonels there and the researchers there in Pentagon never heard of the Philippine-American War. In West Point, there's not a single word, a single letter word, or a picture about the Philippine-American War. And yet, it is considered one of the worst defeats of the Americans in terms of fighting a rebellion. How many Americans died there? They said 99,000 Americans. But some American writer says it's more than that. It goes up to 300,000 Americans who have died in that war. That's why probably America does not like to remember. Who, who will tell that story? Pibau? Perhaps. When we have the museum, because we would like to recreate there the Battle of Gintabuan. And by the way, and this includes three shrines, there are many Japanese shrines here in Negros. There are more Japanese shrines there than there is one Filipino shrine. Very ironic, isn't it? Very sad. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. Currently, the agency is taking necessary efforts for the realization of the project for future shrines to be erected. But currently, we, all, we already have 10, I believe. Yes. Now, uh, Sir Gonzalez, would you like to add something onto that question? Yeah. What are um, I agree completely with the, I agree completely with Sir Sawano's sentiments. Um, so on one hand, there is um, the idea of um, not forgetting. Um, and then, of course, perhaps to a more unconventional extent, um, shrines and museums, think about museums as they are designed in such a way that they tell a story. When you go into a museum, it's being um, arranged or positioned in such a way that it tells a certain narrative. And that narrative um, is based upon 
you know, how people want that story to be told. So it reflects a lot about us just as much as it, refle it reflects a lot about what happened. Um, but perhaps more importantly, I'd like to point um, your attention to what uh, Benedict Anderson calls probably the best example of nationalism, the idea of a cenotaph, um, tomb of an unknown soldier. So the next time you walk to a tomb of an unknown soldier, um, think about the idea that you have you, you will never know who that person is. You don't know how old that person is. You don't know that person's name. Uh, but that person died for, you know, an idea, the idea of nation. Um, and it is actually inviting you um, to be part of that nation. It's reaching out to you um, that you are, you're part of that nation. This guy died for you, but you never met this guy, right? You never met this person, but he died for you. And, he died for a nation which you are now part of. So that's the effect of a shrine for me. Next time you bump into a shrine, it's, it's really trying to evoke not just your emotions, you know, but the way that you think about a community that we are building. A nation is, you know, it, it's something that, um, it's not something that is readily there. It's something that you put together. And so a shrine is part of that attempt to keep that idea of uh, that construct of a nation together. That's why a shrine is important. And that's why narratives in the museum are important. Thank you very much. So I think this will be our last question for this afternoon. Uh, for both of our speakers, what advice would you give, uh, would you give to the Filipino youth who aim to study the battle that took place in Romblon, Panay, and Gimarat? And maybe uh, recommendations for, so, uh, uh, to our participants of oh, books. Maybe you can name books that they might uh, be interested in. Uh, let's start with Dr. Gonzalez. Um, I think it's quite timely uh, for, um, it is quite timely for young people to be looking at the Second World War because, you know, when you're in college, you're, you are at the age when our grandparents, you know, when all these veterans, we're also experiencing the war. Um, so most of the people that I interviewed uh, for my research, I was at that age that they were in when they were just jumping into the war. And so parang I always thought of um, the way I live my life is, is parallel to theirs, but they just rocked so much. They were so, you know, they were so cool and awesome. And they went through one of the most tragic, if not the most challenging period in, in Philippine history. And um, they went through the reconstruction. They went through uh, the Hook, uh, you know, the, the Hook campaign and they went through a dictatorship. They went through a lot of things that we would probably shy away uh, today. And so it's timely because now we are waging what we could probably consider as the war of our time. It's not a shooting engagement. Um, it's, it's a war against COVID. And so all our actions are going to be direct reflections of what our grandparents also did during their time. So I think that's why when, when we study about the war, um, we should make an attempt to use their examples, to use those lessons and try to see what we can do from our end uh, to sort out our own war, which we are experiencing in this time. Thank you very much, Sir, uh, sir Saonoy. Well, usually the young generation forget what happened to the old. And the old try to make the young generation learn what they have undergone. And the, the longer the years, the more difficult they're remembering. And this is where museum, archives, and libraries play a part. But sometimes, people see a book as a difficult thing, especially Filipinos. We are not a reading people. Have you seen anybody in the bus reading? 
a novel or something? Hardly. Newspaper, yes, probably, or comics, they do. But most often, not history books. History, to some, is very difficult to read. My experience is this. People do not like to read history books, but they would like to listen to historical stories. Tamad lang siguro magbasa. That is why, you know, I was watching your presentation of different shrines, telling the stories of what happened there. That's easy. And you know what came to my mind? I'm going to ask you, and your permission, to ask you, first of all, a copy of those presentations. And I'm going to look for means by which I can show them to every school that asked me to speak. Then we can tell people, I did not even know that there are certain signs. Well, I do Corregidor because I got a very, very close up story about Corregidor from the, from the colonel who reconquered Corregidor, General Jones. No? That's why I remember, I'm an honorary member of the 503rd Regimental Combat Team because I was able to help them and they came to Bacolod and I hosted them and we told the story well and they're simply very, very happy about it. If you can give me those, those films, not only for our future museum, I will try to use them with your permission every time I talk, every time I deliver. And I don't know if the Philippine Veterans Bank would be able to establish a program of historical lectures or historical presentations, not only once a year, twice a year, but as often as can be done in every school and in every province. For Negros, I will assure you, if you can give me that, and the Veterans Bank is willing to help, we are going to go from one college to another, one school to another, in order to show those films. Because your shrines are beautiful, but as they say, as the two boys say, what is the beauty of a gem when it stays underneath the sea? the perfume of the flower if it is wasted in the forest. Is that? So the same thing, you have beautiful things there, including you, you too, of course. <laughs> but if they are not seen, I say the point, for many a gem of purest trace serene, in the part of ocean bare, for many flowers is bloomed to blush unseen and waste their perfume in the desert air. That is what you are doing, but you're keeping them to yourselves. And so I thank you. So I, I thank you for this webinar that now that we have the internet, I think you can do more than this. But of course, it's additional work, right? But it should be a happy work. Thank you very much for that, Sir Solar. And we would be more than happy to provide you the copies of those videos. Uh, one of our uh, team, uh, one from our team, will be reaching out to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Thank I you. Yes, I think Dr. Gonzalez would like to add something. Dr. Gonzalez. Yes, ma'am. But it it seems quite a bit anticlimactic after uh, uh, what <laughs> what Sir Solar said about the gem under the sea. Uh, I would like to um, endorse, uh, I think the second part of the question is what kind of books you, you might be interested in reading. Um, so my, my personal favorites are more like personal narratives of uh, people who are in the front line. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that includes uh, things like uh, Salvador or Ramos, um, Ramos's work on Panay. But uh, one of my colleagues who was also my mentor um, Dr. Mabuna, she's working on uh, uh, the oh. Japanese in uh, the Japanese in Iloilo, civilians, uh, migrants, 
and um, she introduced me to a book uh, by a Japanese captain during the Second World War, uh, which I believe was translated to English by virtue of uh, so Dr. Mabona and Dr. Rico Jose uh, had a lot. They put in a lot of work on this, and I think um, she she's actually been asking me to uh, poke Pivo uh, about uh, translating and publishing this, but. If it does come out, um, um, you know, when Pivo makes this happen, this book is going to be a fantastic, um, it, it will offer a fantastic perspective uh, of what happened on the side of the Japanese. And you'll discover things like the Japanese were actually also freaking out about the guerrillas. They were so afraid of the guerrillas. And you don't normally see that because what you normally see is our side of the story, where we are the ones who are afraid, where they're the ones who are terrible. When you look at uh, the Japanese perspective, they, you'll also get to see how horrible Filipinos could actually be. Uh, and that's the realities of the war. Um, but it, it offers you a human perspective. It humanizes the Japanese in many ways. And it gives you a, um, a deeper understanding of the war, not just the narrative that people want to tell you, but you get to decide, you know, what the narrative is. Um, you know, Paul, thank you. Oh, thank you. sorry, the name of the book. The, <laughs> the name of the book, sorry, I missed that. Uh, it's, it's Blood and Mud. Uh, there you go, Blood and Mud by um, Toshimi Kumai, Captain. Thank you very much for that, sir. Now we will be reading one of the comments from our Zoom participants. Okay. I would like to thank all of you in here that because of this webinar, I gained a lot and learned new knowledge about our Philippine history and also acquired how us Filipinos really are resilient and my sincere gratitude to the speakers and the organizers of the webinar for inspiring us and teaching us what happened during the World War II in the Visayan Islands. I truly admire how we still cherish cherish and honor what happened back then and to recognize the spark of nationalism and courage within the Filipinos who participated in the war. As a Filipino, I'm honored to be one to represent our Kababayan as resilient because we are known to be courageous. And as a future Kababayan, I want to encourage many Filipino kids and other foreign people that us Filipinos are truly remarkable. Yeah, so thank you very much for that comment. And I think that ends our open forum for this afternoon. Thank you, every one of our speakers. Uh, we hope to see you in May. We hope to see you both in May for our closing and uh, awarding ceremony. If there's none, no other questions now, we close our open forum. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating in our Q&A portion and for sending in your questions from Zoom and on. Facebook Live. Thank you very much as well to our research speakers for today, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, Mr. Saonay, and Dr. Earl, Cle Earl Jude Paul Cleopet. And as we now near the end of our program, let us have the chairperson of the University of Santo Tomas, Department of History, Dr. Archie Diaz, for his closing remarks. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. From March to August of 1945, the battle for the liberation of Visayas from the Japanese occupational forces was successfully carried out through the operations Victor I and II. This was done to eradicate all Japanese clout within the area of Visayas and portions of Northern Mindanao. Within this time frame, the American and the Filipino liberating forces were able to seize Sambuanga and Palawan from Japanese hands and redirected all the efforts to pursue the total liberation of Bohol, Cebu, Panay, and the Negros Islands. With the collapse of the Japanese resistance in Sambuanga and Sulu, the 8th Army initiated its striking forces to secure the Central Visayan Islands. The 48th Infantry Division became crucial in their occupation of Panay Island, swooping down Guimaras and the northern stretch of Negros Islands. With the continuous attack both from the American reinforcement and, and Filipino guerrillas, less than 3,000 Japanese in Panay Islands, plus the Imperial Army's withdrawal, decided the issue on the island in favor of the Filipinos. At the end of 1945, the 40th Division estimated that only 500 Japanese 
in disorganized small groups remained on Panay, which mounted no immediate pursuit, and Phil American forces launched even minor attacks against the Japanese concentrations. Operations to clear Guimaras Island began as soon as the 185th Infantry secured Iloilo and the 48th Division patrols found no signs of Japanese on the island. Japanese troops lacked many essential items of supply. For example, less than two thirds of their army were armed with only 8,000 rifles. Small arms ammunition was far from adequate. Food could last for little more than two months. The Allied Command, supported by the guerrilla movements, cut off transportation and communication hubs in order to paralyze mobilization of Japanese troops in the Visayan region. The island hopping of the liberating forces became successful in exonerating much of the Visayan region from Japanese fortifications. Our sincerest gratitude to our distinguished speakers this afternoon, the heroism and valiant efforts of the liberating forces especially our fearless guerrillas were magnified in the works of Dr. Ray Carlo T. Gonzalez, who conducted extensive research on the guerrillas of Panay under Colonel Macario Peralta and shared with us the important details of the liberation of the islands and the leading efforts of the guerrillas to liberate their peoples from the clutches of occupation. To Mr. Modesto Sa Onoy, who provided us with the central efforts of the guerrillas under the command of then Colonel Salvador Absede and Major Ernesto Mata in dislodging the Japanese forces in their fortress at Patag. To the Dr. Earl Jude Cleope, who stressed the resistance in the Northern Negros, the Japanese forces assigned to protect the important town of Dumaguete in Negros Oriental and the valiant stand of the guerrillas who were assigned to end the resistance and to liberate the southern areas of the island. Lastly, I would like to commend the tireless efforts of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office through its indefatigable administrator, Undersecretary Ernesto Carolina, and all the officials, staff, and partner institutions, including the UST Department of History, for instilling the value of honoring veterans to the public, creating a platform to tell the stories of our Filipino guerrillas during the war and presenting a historical narrative different from the ones given by the Americans, which conveniently left the contributions of Filipino men and women. Indeed, this afternoon has been academically enlightening with all these scholarly presentations of various topics for the liberation of Panay, Romblon, and Guimaras. Maraming maraming salamat po at magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you very much, Dr. Resi, for your message and of course your continued support. And to finally conclude this episode of the Kagitingan Historical Webinar Lectures, may we have the Administrator of the Philippine Veterans Affairs <coughs> Office, Yusek Ernesto G. Carolina, for his closing message. Let me first uh, greet our guests and lecturers uh, for today, starting with Vice President uh, Miguel Mike Villarreal of the Philippine Veterans Bank, Dr. Ray Gonzalez of uh, the University of uh, the Philippines, uh, Visayas, Mr. Modesto Saonoy, author of the books Against the Rising Sun and Guerrilla War in Negros, and uh, the curator of the Battle of uh, Patag uh, Museum. I'd like to greet also uh, Dr. Earl Jude Cleope of uh, the Siliman University and Professor Jose Romel Hernandez of the De La Salle uh, University. I wish to greet as well our beloved uh, veterans, their spouses, sons and daughters, and other stakeholders who are participating in our third Kagitingan webinar for the year 2022. A pleasant afternoon to all of you. We have moved to the third episode of the 2022 Kagitingan webinar lectures. But today is especially remarkable for we are also 
Commemorating the 77th liberation of Panay, Romblon, and Dimaras Islands from Japanese occupation forces. The liberation of Panay, Romblon, and Dimaras is considered as one of the most successful resistance movements in the Philippines during the Second World War. Complementing the valiant efforts of the Free Panay guerrilla forces, led by uh, Colonel Macario Peralta of the 6th Military District against the Japanese forces, the cooperation with the then Iloilo Governor Tomas Confessor also contributed to the victory in the liberation of Panay. As the guerrillas and the provincial government collaborated closely together, the resistance movement also inspired the civilians and as such, received unqualified support and assistance from the people of Panay, Romblon, and Dimaras. The 6th Military District started the liberation of Romblon with a surprise landing during the night of March 11 and 12, 1945, and it slowly went on until the enemy resistance was overcome on April 3. In Panay Island, the guerrilla troops subjected the Japanese to attacks in their city garrisons until they withdrew to the rough highlands of Alimujan in South Central Panay. The 48th Infantry Division, led by uh, the 185th Infantry Regiment, launched a beach bombardment and landed in Tigbawan, Iloilo, without any serious interference from the Japanese forces. Subsequently, the islands of Guimaras and Inampulungan were also cleared. The retaking of Panay Island was part of the military operation Victor One, which also aimed to liberate uh, Negros Occidental. Since the liberation forces landed without opposition, they were uh, able to immediately attack the Japanese forces in Iloilo City on March 20, 1945. In two days, all the Japanese forces in Panay Island had been crushed or defeated. Thereafter, the Liberation Forces proceeded to carry out its next mission to liberate Negros Occidental. In honor of the Panay guerrillas and all the men and women who contributed to the liberation of Panay, Romblon, and Gimaras, we have taken the whole liberation journey of the Visayas into its spotlight in this webinar. The operations of the combined Filipino and U.S. liberation forces to free its province of the Visayas is one gripping historical account which showcases a series of swift and decisive military tactics. But more than this, we are reminded once again of the significant role of the veterans and all the adversities they experience to secure the country's freedom and attain lasting peace. This webinar may not be long enough to narrate all the gallant stories of our veterans, but we hope that the lessons on honor, valor, and patriotism exemplified by our veterans may be ingrained in our memories for a long time, long enough to be able to retell the stories and pass on the lessons learned over and over again. After all, our veterans deserve to be remembered beyond the grave for all the sacrifices they have given for our generation and the generations to come. As we close today's webinar, we in the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office hope that uh, the discussions we had today motivate you as well to serve our nation and our fellow men with the same passion and dedication as our veterans had done. Thank you and see you again 
on the next episode of the 2022 Kagitingan webinar. Thank you very much, Yusek Carolina, for your message. Once again, for those who were able to pre-register, we will be sending a link to your email. Kindly accomplish this evaluation form for your certificate of participation. You will receive your e-certificate after a day. Kindly check your spam folder in case it was sent there instead of your inbox. And for the next episode of our Kagitingan webinar lecture, here's our schedule. There you go. We have Women of Resistance on March 31, same time at 10 a.m. We will be joined by Mr. John Leakey Candelaria, uh, who will be discussing Dainty Hands Do You Go Work, depicting Filipino women in Japanese wartime propaganda. Uh, next is Dr. Jose Victor Torres, who will be discussing Sisters of St. Clair during World War II. Also, Ms. Naomi Hemera will be discussing women of Hukbalaha, and of course, Ms. Desiree Benipayo, who will be discussing women of war. And we hope to see all of you next week for this episode. Now, before we officially end our program, may we now have a photo op together with our resource speakers. So I am requesting everyone to please turn your cameras on. Both our participants and speakers, please turn your cameras on. There you go. I will be having our photo op. Okay, next step, uh, next page. Okay, next. Next one. Last one. There you go. Once again, thank you very much. Now, uh, let's have Dr. Gonzalez once again for his parting words. Or maybe you have future lectures, just like this one, sir, and maybe you can promote it here. Or books that you would like to read. Or uh, recommend. Um, well, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity you've given me. Um, and I hope to see you again in, in similar um, conferences or research uh, opportunities. Um, other than that, God bless everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, sir. Sir Saonoy? Well, I would like to thank you for this uh, opportunity to share with you and to our participants uh, what happened to Negros. Uh, it took just two, almost three weeks of fighting the Japanese in Iloilo, but it took four months to fight the Japanese in the cross. It was a long fight. But somehow we survived and we have progress. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. and Dr. Gonzalez. And that concludes our today's episode of Kagitingan Historical Webinar Lectures. And we thank everyone for joining us this afternoon, and we hope to see you soon in the next one. I am Maya Grace Sahagun. And I am Felice Lois Lanya. We have been your hosts for today. Thank you, and good afternoon. Mabuhay, Mabuhay po tayo tayo